latent solution to enhance the value of ServiceNow investment. And we will kick it off. My name is Mark Thompson. I'm the Director of ITSM Products here at Blazant. Years of experience in service management, customer support, and in different areas of the uh, value chain. My co-presenter and really the, the voice of the webinar today is Michael Ludwig. I'll let Michael introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Ludwig. I'm the Chief Product Architect for Blazant. I uh, have over 30 years of experience in IT operations, uh, service management, and software development, as well as <clears throat> extensive experience data modeling within BMC's Atrium products and ServiceNow. And uh, we'll be sharing, uh, sharing some tips and tricks with you today. Glad everyone could attend. Yes, once again, we really appreciate uh, everyone taking time either morning or afternoon or evening. I know that different uh, people are in different stages. Some of you may have already purchased a Blazing Solution or on the cusp of purchasing solution, and you've probably had some initial meetings with our with our sales team and SE team. So we'll cover a lot of different areas, start out uh, kind of a recap, and then really go in-depth with some of the technical details that – we have encountered as we've worked with numerous customers that have deployed our solution and worked with ServiceNow as well as other ITSM vendors. So it's going to be a very knowledgeable uh, presentation today. We really want to make this uh, an interactive dialogue also. So during the major section breaks, we will have some Q&A time so you can get your questions answered real time over some major sections. Hopefully you are all now on the on the uh, WebEx that we do have, and that there is a question chat area, the chat area where you can submit your questions. We'll periodically be answering these questions as we as we go, and we'll also open up the the phone lines so you can ask them some real live questions. But everyone's muted now, just because we don't want any background noise to distract from from the content. So where are we? Is accurate IT data really a problem worth solving? Well, obviously, uh, you joined today in Blazant. We definitely believe it is. We've been doing numerous webinars with some of our partners talking about this IT data accuracy challenge that you all are probably experiencing. And some of our interactive polls, our customers definitely agree. They definitely want more accurate data, 64% in one poll, and 31% that you mentioned that, you know, data issues were the biggest hurdle and seem to be implementations. And I really say service management implementations because seem to be itself is really that linchpin where all the data flows for your service management where you're making decisions. And we'll talk about that a little later. We were recently at K14, which is ServiceNow's uh, knowledge experience. I think they had close to 6,000 attendees was their, was their goal. And one of the key areas that always came across in a lot of the presentations I attended and others, whether it be from other vendors or customers, is as they're looking for service management, data, data integrity, data quality, how do I get my data right, always came up as the top of the list of some of the key action items or lessons learned in a lot of the presentations. People realize with, you know, as we talk to one customer, if you own your data, you really own your destiny. And that's what we are truly believe it at here at Blazon, and we've been talking to our customers around really how do we get the data right, how can we help you, and we'll get into the cura, some deep details of that, especially there's some challenges just around understanding best practices, difference between asset and, and CMDB, and Michael will touch on. Negative impacts, right? We'll start out, what are the negative impacts, right? If you've got bad data, what's going on? Some of the Gartner surveys recognize that, you know, maybe 60% of incidents or bad changes are self-inflicted due to data quality or, or bad data issues. And a lot of it has to do with, with people making the bad decisions on that data, which we'll talk about is if you don't have the right data, how are you effectively making the right decisions, where are those incidents coming from? Can you really do effective change management and understand change impact, change collision? If you understand where your data is, what's connected to what, 
how the CIs are configured in your CMDB. So self-inflicted, and it could be inaccurate or incomplete. If you don't really have a good handle on all the data in your environment, what are the attributes, where items are located, so it's not only bad data, it's just incomplete. You don't have enough to make effective decisions, and you don't want to do the, the hope and pray method. Mean time resolution, obviously, incidents are going to occur, right? This is software, hardware. Things are going to occur in your environment. You are going to have incidents. That's why you bought a service management platform, service management tool, to manage those incidents and problems and changes, right? It is a, a great tool for that. But you want to make sure that you've got the processes and people in place to rectify those. How can you really do root cause if you don't have the good data that's needed for that? So the service management system, and Michael will talk about, is, you know, it's still a tool, but it's really based on how you're effectively utilizing the tool and the underlying data, which is really, <coughs> excuse me, going to make you successful. So what about Blazent? Right, your environment with Blazent. Many times customers really focus on having a limited set of data because they really can't handle it, because they can't handle the speed and the volume and the data. So typically, before Blazent, they'll have maybe a discovery source or two, a Active Directory, very prevalent, and obviously some legacy systems. So we're finding a lot of customers really only rely on a couple key data elements or data sources they consider trusted. But we believe and we are strongly get support that more data is better data, right? You want to have a complete coverage of your estate. So Blazent, we want to have you have all the data sources possible in your environment. And we can go handle that because we can do the aggregation of that and validation. We do the reconciliation with our direct and indirect association and consolidate and verify that data accuracy with our scoring algorithms and business rules, and we get to, to that golden record, which is the best uh, source that you can have to have the accurate data. And Michael will talk a little bit more about that. You know, we've integrated over 200, 220 data sources, and we really believe strongly that with Blazent, you can increase the amount of data sources as well as the information that you're getting it flowing into your system to get the most out of that service management platform. We'll talk about service now to have those applications, incident, problem, change, release, obviously the service levels are key around the consideration of service management to make it effective. We solve that problem for you. I'm going to continue to harp on it that data accuracy is the key, right? We at Blazon have the current complete uh, scenarios that we do have around the uh, the data that, that you do have, that is your data current, is it complete, is it accurate, do you have that data? Well, if you've got inaccurate data and it's flowing in your system, you're going to make bad decisions, right? Those are those negative impacts which we uh, talked about. So you're going to have the, the bad decisions. But with accurate data, all those processes, you're making more effective decisions, you're, redu you're reducing the outages, you can really stand up change management, which is a key critical aspect. The change management is, a, is a competitive weapon that you can use as an IT organization. If you can make changes faster uh, with less risk, you can react to changing business conditions much more rapidly. We've talked a lot about the you know direct, but there's also indirect benefits. Obviously. The cost, everyone wants that cost of incident resolution. You're going to have incidents. You want to resolve them as fast as possible. You don't want those self-inflicted challenges. You want to improve the risk. But what about those indirect benefits? Availability. Can you really measure increased availability in your organization? Right. Everyone wants uptime. Having that delta, having your productive users are still some of those huge indirect benefits that's not always easy to quantify, but it's very important in your organization. Right? You, why do you buy service management? Why are you having these tools? Because you want to make your non-IT staff more productive. You want to keep them up and running so they can do their job and make sure that they have the right information available for them. Governance, governance and risk. What does it cost to fail an audit? Right? How can you help speed up the information needed to help you pass that audit faster, 
right? Not always easy to quantify, but you know you have these initiatives in your organization. And overall, everything that you can do is all around continual service improvement. One of the key linchpins around ITSM and ITL processes is you have a continual service improvement for what you deliver. There's a continuum for delivering your service management solution. It's not a, it's not a you release it and it's done, right? There's always an evolution of life cycle. You want to make sure that the information that's going in, that you're continually updating, continual service improvement. So with Blazing, with our current complete and correct data, we can help you leverage all those benefits. So I've talked a lot about the overall Blazing solution. Some of you may have heard this, but a lot of you haven't, of how those benefits, the service management system, we want to help you leverage that it, the, uh, the investment that you made in service management. I'll bring it over to Michael, and he'll get into the technical details of references, CI population, some of the key areas that we have found as we've worked with numerous customers that have deployed these service management platforms and some of the pitfalls and how Blazing can help you. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Mark. When I, uh, when I think about implementing uh, a service management platform for the first time or I think about recovery efforts uh, for uh, an implementation that didn't go so well, uh, really starts with me for straightening out the reference systems. So the reference tables that are shared, uh, that control significant attributes both on the asset and the CI side, particularly within ServiceNow. And so I'm going to start off by talking about those because to me that's a logical starting place. So I would address these issues before I ever populated my first CI or asset. So there are really two areas that we want to talk about. Uh, the first one is uh, what's known as the common tables, and they begin with CMN underscore in the ServiceNow vernacular, and they control things like locations, cost centers, and departments. And these are shared across CIs and asset both and are very important downstream when it comes to reporting, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Secondarily to that are the product model areas. And these are very important because this is what houses the normalized hardware and software values for the system. And there are two major sections. One is product model, which is actually CMDB underscore model, uh, were you to look at it from a schematic point of view. And then there's also CMDB underscore CI SPKG, which stands for software package. So software package is a replication of the software section of CMDB model, but it is also the area that draws the relationship to software installations to the CI that they're installed on. So it's very, very important that these be non-duplicated and highly normalized areas that you plan for and you plan the population of these separate then you plan the population of your assets or CIs. So some, some things that we've determined through our experience with many customers is, is good practices. The reference table data should be deduplicated and normalized prior to table population. And then you should treat them as a constrained list of values. So what do I mean by that? I mean that you have a process in place so that new values do not get added to these tables unless they are coming through a review process and have been normalized and checked for duplication prior to their population. And so as, as I talked about earlier, these tables should not be initially populated as part of a CI or asset import set as part of a CI or asset stand-up. They should be populated first before CI or asset population begins. And that's a key point, Michael. You know, I don't know, you may have talked to a customer or you run across a customer experience where the, where they didn't happen, I'm sure there's there's lots of pitfalls that you may be able to talk to, but I don't want that point to uh, 
point to die is that, you know, that's critical because I know you and I have had some conversations of why it's really, really important that this process flow be in place. Yeah, it's, it's really important, Mark. And we've seen a, a number of situations where, where people have engaged Blazon to try to help them out with a stand-up that, that has gotten away from them. And, and one of the things that I see most common is that people allow uh, attributes like locations and departments and cost centers and uh, the models themselves to actually flow in as part of a CI or asset import. And when that happens, uh, you're essentially leaving these reference tables, the quality of the data of them, to a system that's usually being populated out of a, a manual system that was maintained and there are all kinds of problems that stem from this, and, and we'll show you a few examples of those. So I've picked a couple of examples here that are probably easily recognizable to those who work with data all the time, but the first one is a location example. And so we see two examples, one, two, three, four, abbreviation for West Grand River, or Grand Boulevard, and 1234 West Grand Boulevard spelled out. This is a very common scenario. Uh, these actually are duplicates of one another. They're the same address. But because humans have entered them into key fields over a course or period of time, uh, they were blown into a system exactly like you see them here. Another example comes out of the manufacturer area, which is part of the product model definition and also rolls up to core company within ServiceNow, where we actually see four different ways of entering Dell. So we have Dell, Dell Inc., then we have all uppercase Dell and all uppercase Dell Inc. So these are actual examples that I pulled out of a reference table that had gone awry. And so it's important to understand what kind of problems these create down the road. So <clears throat> this really creates problems because CIs will actually be attached to these different representations. So in the first example I gave, CIs will be split across two location values that are actually the same location. And so imagine, if you would, what would happen from a report from that perspective. So in the second example, CIs will be split across four manufacturer values that are actually the same manufacturer. And this really begins to hurt you as you start to look at reporting. So imagine, if you will, someone asks a question and uh, desires an answer from the ServiceNow system, tell me how many CIs we have at a particular location. And that location is 1234 West Grand Boulevard. Well, you're never going to get a true number because the CIs are actually split across those two variations of the same address. And so unless you were aware that there were, in fact, two variations of the same address and could sum the, the quantities of each together, you would never be able to accurately report on the question asked. So say, for example, in the second uh, example I gave, you're trying to determine what is your footprint with Dell. Say it's time to negotiate a new contract with them. You want to know what your footprint with them is so that you have some notion of what kind of leverage you'll have. Your CIs are actually split across four different versions of Dell. And so it becomes very difficult to get a true answer of what is your footprint with Dell? Because you would actually have to know that within the system you have four different iterations of the same manufacturer and sum together all of the answers in order to come up with an appropriate number. And you can imagine how difficult this problem becomes as it's multiplied over all of these common reference tables. Yeah, that's huge, Michael, because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you want to make right decisions on, on, on the correct data. You want to make informed decision-making, and not only, you know, the manufacturer may be coming to you, you just will really want to understand where you stand in an organization. Maybe you're looking to consolidate. 
you know, CIs or, or license management. It just it just multiplies. Bad data just leads to so many bad decisions, and you really can't uh, make effective use of it. Well, that's awesome. So we've mentioned a lot of the problems and pitfalls through all the various experiences and how we've helped customers. Let's touch on how we can help and, you know, what we do with uh, with our solution. So, yeah, one of the first things we do is uh, – as, as people hand us their incoming data, so all the impound, in, inbound data that they want to leverage to stand up a ServiceNow implementation, one of the first things we do is we dedupe and normalize based off the import data sets. And then we can provide a clean list for table population of these reference structures via an import set. And what that does is that provides you a deduped very normalized list that you then can control from that point forward. And so what do I mean by control? So I mentioned earlier that you want to treat these things as constrained lists so that bad values or duplicate values don't find their way in. And the way that we do that is we, we analyze the values that are coming in through the incoming data sets. And if a value is presented in the incoming data set that's not a match to the constrained list that we are aware of, then the value is not populated into the ServiceNow environment. And then what we do is we provide customer uh, a list of values that are presented in the incoming data but that are not a match. And then the customer can decide whether it is indeed a valid, <coughs> a valid value and should be added to the constrained list or not. And then it becomes a cycle of identifying these outliers, deciding whether they should be put in or not, and if so, putting them in so that the next time the data is presented, it will be validated and inserted. And this is, again, as I mentioned, this is really, really important, particularly when you start to look at things that affect financials, like cost centers or groups or those types of things. So this is the this is really the the output of what we've learned from our engagements and the best practice around how to handle these reference tables. No, that's awesome because I think it mentions back to the continual service improvement process that I mentioned. That's really we're continuing to iterate, or we work with the customers, continue to iterate as part of a as part of the strategy. So we want to uh, take a quick break, not break, excuse me. A quick uh, pause for any questions we may have. I haven't seen any, th any come through uh, the chat, so if you want to ask a, a question via chat, please go ahead real quick before we go to, to the next major section. I know there's a lot of information. Once again, we'll open up the lines at the end for you know a comprehensive Q&A, but if something came up specifically, we wanted to give you a, a moment or two to, to ask a question so we can answer it. Um, as quickly as possible uh, before we go to another key critical area around populating the, the CIs and assets in, into your system. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat. We'll give uh, 30 seconds or so and let Michael take a quick break and, and get a little water as we move forward. We don't see any right now, but once again, we will have a, uh, at the end, we'll have, we'll definitely have time for questions. So we started the first half of really talking about the integrity of the data structures and the criticality of that. Now let's talk about populating the, the CIs or assets, populating your, your CMDB and your asset. There's a great intersection regarding asset and, and config and just strategies around populating the CIs that we've got years of experience with. Michael, let's talk about populating those CIs, right? We want to get the data in the system, but, wow, it's not an easy thing, and you really need to think about it, right? Yeah, Mark, it's, it's really, really, really important, and I can't stress this enough, to really understand the environment before you actually start down a path. Uh, you, you mentioned there's a great intersection, and uh, I chuckled to myself when you said that because, one of the things that happens in intersections a lot is accidents occur. And if, if you don't understand the way the environment works, accidents will occur, and you'll find yourself in a position where 
you're going to have to rethink your strategy and perhaps start your implementation over again. So the first area that I'd really like to talk about there is uh, just a cursory overview of the of the out-of-the-box business rules that govern asset and CI creation within ServiceNow. So for those of you who, who may just be starting a ServiceNow implementation or are not aware that these business rules exist, there is a inward facing towards each other set of business rules, two business rules, that govern how assets and CIs are created and what happens on the other side when one or the other is created. And so this is really controlled, and I'm going to actually open a ServiceNow instance and show you where this is controlled. Let me share out. Yeah, it's very, very, ServiceNow is such a, yes, Michael gets it, such a powerful platform, great business rules, great infrastructure, but you really have to know what you're doing, and, uh, you know, Michael's going to show you some demonstration of why it's critical and, and just some things to look for, and we've, you know, we definitely work with you on. So, so this is uh, an area within the product called model category, and model category really controls the table placement of both CIs and assets. So if you look down here where my cursor is uh, sitting just below computer, you see that the CI class is really the table where computers live uh, within ServiceNow, which is CMDB underscore CI computer. And then you also see its corresponding placement on the asset side which is ALM underscore hardware. And so for those things that are both CIs and assets, you want to have them populated as such within the model category table. Now that intersects with individual models themselves as their control within product model and let me pop one of these open and show you how this works. So underneath a product model definition, there's something here called asset tracking strategy. And so what this says, if I open this drop down, is you can either leave to category, which means the following. If I were to insert a computer CI, it would also create a corresponding record on ALM underscore hardware. If I were to create an asset, which would be initially populated on ALM underscore hardware, it would also create a CI that would exist on CMDB CI underscore computer. I can also choose to don't create asset, which means if a CI comes in via discovery, for example, and it creates a new CI, that a corresponding asset for this particular product model would not be created. In other words, it would turn off the business rule temporarily for this particular model only, or the business rule would not fire, I guess is the way I should say it, uh, to create the corresponding asset once the CI has been created. So, the consumable assets are meant to handle something else, so that's really not a choice for this particular product model, but that gives you some idea of the complexity of understanding how these things work together. Now, it gets even further complicated when you start to look at how primary identifiers are really handled differently on the asset and CI sides of the house, and so I would really, really encourage you to learn about how these business rules interact with one another before you start down the path. Uh, I've walked into at least five implementations within the last year where really the customer didn't understand how that these business rules were there and how they worked, and they went through an initial population and found out that, in, in, in essence, they had to start over again. So I would really caution you about be very knowledgeable about how these things work together. 
And I would call that out, Michael. You mentioned that that's critical, right, is not understanding is there's a technical, but there's also like a business aspect to it, right? I mean, the asset management team, right, or domain, whatever lack of a better description, the CMDB, the people in the CIs really have to get to the table and talk together, right? That, that's another area. I know you've talked to a lot of customers that the two teams really didn't know, you know, had never met each other. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, I, you know, it's amazing how many of these folks just know each other from visits to the water cooler or, or uh, the pop machine or whatever it is. But, yeah, in the, in the, in the world of an integrated service management platform and really the world of SACM, uh, it, uh, it is amazing how much of these things are now intertwined. And so to treat them as segregate disciplines, which they really are, Devoid of one another is really, really a, a bad concept. Uh, you have to need to make sure that your processes intersect with one another uh, because standing as two siloed organization is a recipe for trouble in this type of service management system. So the second area I, I wanted to take a moment and talk about is the most common way to populate CIs uh, or assets, for that matter, into ServiceNow is to do it <clears throat> via an import set. Uh, either that or to use uh, an integration of sorts to directly integrate some particular tool. And regardless of whether you're doing an integration or you're doing an import set, a transform map is actually going to control how the incoming data is populated into the corresponding table structures. <clears throat> and so it's important that you understand a notion in the ServiceNow environment called coalescing. And this is really your only guard against creating either duplicate assets, CIs, or both. And so the notion of coalescing is setting up so that certain fields are treated as primary keys, essentially. And so a, a record is created, for example, the out-of-the-box rule says that service now is the coalesce value, or excuse me, serial number is the coalesce value. So that means that there is a lookup every time an insert tries to take place on the table, and if it already finds that the serial number that's trying to be inserted exists, it will not allow that insert. And so you can see how this coalesce is very important in guarding against the creation of duplicate CIs or assets or both. So in our experience, serial number is not significant enough to stand up on its own as a coalesce value, and I would look at your processes for both the onboarding of assets or the discovery of CIs, the intersection of those things, and then develop a series of use cases to determine what the sufficient coalesce for your particular environment would be. Again, I want to mention, and this is critical, this is really your only safeguard from creating duplicate CIs or assets or both. So the third point that I'd like to go into is that you really need to validate potential CI candidates before they're processed into ServiceNow via an import set. Uh, the default status of a newly created CI within ServiceNow is installed. So I'll tell you a little story about a customer that I dealt with at the back half of last year who, who had purchased ServiceNow and they, they thought they had a good handle on what was going on, and they had a plan to migrate from HP Asset Center to the ServiceNow platform. And so they decided that they were simply going to take the output of HP Asset Center, and they were going to run it into the CI tables. And so they'd done a good job about determining what the sys classes were and how how the asset classes coming from Asset Center lined up to the SIS classes that were out of the box within ServiceNow. 
and they put together the import set and they let it rip. What they didn't understand or didn't think about was that they actually had assets that were in various life cycle statuses coming out of Asset Center and that life cycle status isn't, ha isn't handled within the CI side of things within ServiceNow. And so they had assets that were in the warehouse, they had assets that were stolen or lost or disposed of, and those all went into their ServiceNow implementation as installed active CIs. And so it's really good to understand exactly what you're doing and validate the existence, on, and that would be an active existence, of all CIs before you process them into the ServiceNow platform. Then the fourth thing is I would recommend you have a very sound strategy for normalizing all CI elements, which is the way that ServiceNow refers to attributes, uh, for case sensitivity and valid values. So anybody, again, who, who works with data on a regular basis knows the problem with case, that some people do all uppercase, some people do cam case, mixed case. It's it's, it, it, it is a wide variety, and those should all be normalized so that all of the values are consistent across your entire environment. And then what I mean by valid values is a lot of times in primary identifiers, we see where somebody has typed in, for example, in asset tag, unknown or unavailable. So that is, in fact, a, a value. It is not a null field, but it is not a valid value. And so those types of things should be removed prior to entry into. So, for example, uh, one of the things that we see consistently is that someone will set a coalesce up on serial number alone and then have asset tag added to the coalesce. So their coalesce is on serial number and asset tag. And so those two fields create the unique identifier for any given CI. Well, they have virtual devices that don't have a serial number, and the asset tag for all virtual devices was entered as unknown. And so they have a series of what become duplicate CIs because the only primary identifiers are identical between those. And I've seen that happen over and over again. So you need to have a sound strategy for understanding what the incoming values are going to be and how they affect the downstream system before you ever begin population. And again, I, I, can't, uh, I can't stress how important that is for primary identifiers. Another, uh, another common problem is if you're migrating from another company's CMDB, into the ServiceNow platform, you really need to understand the differences between the two data models. And it, it's very, very important. So I've, I've given you a simple example here. Uh, in BMC Atrium, uh, the OS is a CI of its own, separated from its chassis, and then they're associated together through a parent-child relationship. In ServiceNow, OS is an element or an attribute of the CI it resides on, and no relationship exists between them. And so you can imagine if you're migrating from BMC to ServiceNow, the complexity of understanding how you're going to handle that in terms of format coming out of the BMC system and how you would handle that through an import set and transform map into the ServiceNow system. And this is just a simple example. There are much more complex examples, and it really can become a wide variety when you look at different vendors like HP or, or excuse me, CA or Surewell, uh, BMC, ServiceNow. Every one of the data models varies significantly from one another. No, that, that's awesome background, Michael, on, you know, population, because, you know, Key use cases that we've been looking at and working with that we expound upon is, you know, different customers on the call or prospects are at different stages. Some are looking for that initial population of the CIs into the CMDB, which we can certainly help with. 
It's the migration between vendors, which is very common. ServiceNow is, you know, exploding in the market. They're getting a lot of migration customers from some of the vendors that, that you had mentioned. As, and we understand that as well as, you know, they've already maybe initially populated their CMDB and it's just struggling and, and we can certainly help with all those areas, right? Yeah, it's really, uh, it's really the core of, of, of why we designed the particular product that, that we're talking about. Um, there's lots of ways we can help. Uh, first of all, we have extensive ServiceNow knowledge, uh, and our data quality solution and our ServiceNow integration are onboarding data in some, into some of the most complex uh, ServiceNow implementations that are already in production. Uh, so customers, big and small, they all have the same problems. The bigger ones tend to tend to have more complex problems because they might have three, four, or more outsourcers involved in the environment as well as controlling certain aspects of their own data, but the problems remain the same no matter what the scenario is. And really, our data quality solution was designed to be an onboarding engine for ServiceNow and other service management platforms. And then it was also designed to maintain the quality of that data, to create a closed-loop system where the quality of the data was continuously monitored, and not just for CIs themselves, but for their attributes, the reference table structures that we talked about earlier, and the CI to CI relationships that form the underpinnings for the business service mappings that everyone si finds to be such a, a valuable commodity within ServiceNow. I mean, the goal really of implementing a sophisticated service management platform is twofold. One is to be able to create those relationship mappings and understand what a business service looks like from a technological perspective from end to end. And then the role that that plays, as Mark mentioned earlier, in the downstream ITSM functions that rely on the CMDB data. So change management, you know, Understanding, if I make these changes, what is going to be the impact to the business service that has technology pinning it? So those are really, really important things to take into consideration and to continue to maintain. You need to create some form of process for continuous data quality and data quality improvement, and really our product fits right in that wheelhouse. Um, as part of it, all CI data presented to Blazon is cleansed, normalized, and then associated to present a unified view of all data, but then we take it one step further. We provide a series of analytics, and those analytics move a rules engine into your hand so that for Floodlight, for example, which is meant for the onboarding of new CIs, a rules engine that allows you to create rules that you find are sufficient to validate CIs before they ever become part of an import set that you would bring into ServiceNow. Or, for example, our bullseye analytics, which are really meant to maintain the underlying elements of a CI or attributes of a CI and their associated relationship, to give you a rules engine to create a rule structure for governing the ongoing data quality of those elements and relationships as data changes within your environment. So those are very, very important things. And to my knowledge, we're, we're the only company out there that's really providing this service uh, to both the ServiceNow and other ITSM vendors. Yeah, and then one of the key things is, you know, these rules engines, they're, they're configurable. It's point and click. There's no customization. You're not coding, which is, a, you know, a unique uh, uh, benefit that we do provide to the customers. Yeah, as part of our experience, uh, we've really, really been able to, to fine-tune some algorithms that underpin these rules engines so that you're more or less uh, navigating through a UI that allows you to either drag or point and click to create some very sophisticated rules around validation and ongoing maintenance of the quality of the information within the CMDB. So our integration 
uh, really creates a symbiotic union between Blazent and your ServiceNow environment. And this is done through a series of web service connections. So as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the reference structures, we are continually aware of what the reference structures within your ServiceNow environment contain, and that's how we're able to maintain them as a constrained list instead of allowing values that don't exist within that constrained list to easily flow into them. Uh, that's Again, that's just one example of, of the union between the two systems. And then our integration also creates a custom workflow within ServiceNow itself to handle data quality issues identified out of our bullseye solution. And then it allows you several ways that you can resolve these. Uh, you can resolve them by working through them by individuals in a task flow manner, or you also can make automated rules uh, so that changes that are detected within Blazent that should be processed through to the ServiceNow system are done automatically based on the rules that you set forth. So you really don't need any human intervention to maintain the quality of the data as that data shifts on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that's awesome because the data will shift. We know that, right? Data is not, it's not a static, static operation. And with our integration, which, you know, we'd even mentioned most of you, you already know, we have a certified integration. So we work hand in hand with ServiceNow. You're still leveraging the workflow as needed in ServiceNow to, to, to take the right process to update or to take those remediation actions in the closed loop. But we also have the automation, right? It's no need to do, make it a, uh, additional steps processes. Once you have everything nailed down and you know what you want to do, we've built in that, that automation so it's automatically processed. Things are, things are updated. Items under change control still have that tracking mechanism so you can see the reporting. You can understand what updates were made so you're not losing any value. We're enhancing the value of that ServiceNow investment. Yeah, that's, that's true, Mark. And, and really, uh, the whole notion is why create more work? Uh, because managing uh, a sophisticated ITSM environment is enough work on its own. And so let it, let's take care of things where we can nail down ironclad business rules to handle scenarios. Let's allow that automation to work so that the knowledgeable professionals that you have on your staffs can focus their times on solving real problems. And, and that's really the notion behind it. I think what we should do now, if we could, is uh, open up the lines of, of everyone and, and let's let everybody ask some questions and, and see what kinds of things they're thinking about or maybe they have some experiences they'd like to share. Yeah, we'll go ahead and, and, and do that. You know, we've been, mo I've been monitoring the, the chat and everyone's, you know, probably heads down taking in all that information that they do, you know, trying to make sense of it and get into the head. I'll unmute the lines now, so if people do have questions, please feel free because we wanted to to leave some time. I know it's a lot of information in a in a short in a short time period, but we wanted to make sure that you know you have a chance to share your experiences as well as you know maybe there's one concept you didn't quite get or understand because we know it's important decisions where you are in the in the process of like I said either standing up your new service management system or, or migrating from another vendor, whatever the case may be, we want to make sure that you got as much information as possible. So the lines are open, so if you hear people chewing or clicking, that, that's what's going on. But please feel free to uh, ask any questions that you do have as we recap of the information regarding the, the criticality for data. We talked about that, uh, making the right decisions as you have your IT service management or service now platform, some of those decisions that be made, some of the value that our other customers have expounded upon as well as our experiences at, at you know, K14 or just conversations with customers. Michael covered key, you know, technical details regarding the integrity of the reference structures, which is awesome, Mark. as well as, uh, you know, some of the CI population. Looks like Drew Clinton has a mess uh, has a uh, has raised his hand. Drew, I believe that your line's unmuted, so please go ahead and ask your question. Thanks. I, uh, the first question I had was, uh, could you remind me? Bullseye is the name of the product that handles the uh, continuous improvement data integrity 
what was the name of the product that handled the, the initial data migration, data cleansing? Yeah, it's called Floodlight. Okay. Uh, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about uh, where the product Floodlight begins and ends and whether or not it's possible. It, it, from, from this presentation, it sounded like it was intended primarily to feed into a product like ServiceNow. Um, it, it, is, is it also possible for it to somehow feed back into the systems that it was cleansing? You know, it, it's, it's operating on one or more systems of record, uh, and right. there might be many other applications that besides ServiceNow or the ITSM tool that work or rely on those systems of record. So I was, right. I was wondering what the general strategy would be there. So that's a great question, Drew. Um, so really, really to understand the answer that I'm going to give you, uh, you have to understand some things about, about how Blazent works and why it's so good at what it does. Um, and the reason for that is that our data model is very atomic and much more atomic than either BMC, Atrium, or ServiceNow's platform. And so where, for example, in either of those worlds, operating system is really a, a three or four field uh, attribute, in, in our world it's a seven. Uh, and so what's really going on through that integration is there's a series of reverse operations that are taking the highly atomicized blazent data model and converting it to the target system's data model. And so the short answer to your question is we would have the ability to leverage either bullseye or floodlight to other systems but we really need to build out what that reverse operation is based on the data model of the system that it would be pointing towards. And so we're doing that at a very slow pace uh, because working through all of the use cases of, of the differences between the data models, as you might imagine, takes an extensive amount of time. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question for you? Uh, yes, I think it did. Thank you. Great, great, great question, Drew. So we still have a few minutes left. Um, please feel free to ask any questions. You know, you've got a wealth of experience on the phone uh, today. We want to make sure that uh, you know that you've taken your time out your day that you get any answers uh, answers done. A lot of you have already had initial meetings. We wanted to provide a little more in depth information, make it available for you. So please, if uh, Anyone else has any other questions? Feel free to ask. You know, this is your your chance. Uh, how are the uh, how are the solutions generally leveraged? Is this uh, is this always something that would be uh, installed someplace somewhere in house? Uh, so you you run uh, Bullseye or uh, Floodlight on multiple nodes on on some resources in house, or is it more of a a cloud solution? Yeah, it's a, it, uh, so we, I, I'm not gonna fib to you. It is primarily a cloud solution, and a majority of our custom, uh, customers are in the cloud. But for select customers who have extenuating circumstances, uh, we also do provide an on-premise product. Uh, so both exist. Uh, generally, we, uh, we have files present to us. So what we do is either we extract or we ask the customer to extract flat file exports from all of the data systems that they wish to migrate into ServiceNow, and we encourage you to, to use as many as possible because the degree of accuracy tends to rise uh, to a certain point uh, where there are diminishing returns, but uh, generally, that isn't reached until, uh, you know, for, for I would say a mid-sized enterprise, uh, until you get up to the 1820 neighborhood, uh, or for a large enterprise, uh, somewhere between 25 and 35. Okay. 
Yeah, around 18 data sources, we did some research, seems to be kind of the sweet spot of having, you know, enough coverage. Obviously, you're really, really small, but, uh, you know, we had done, we had actually contracted and had, uh, you know, a analyst kind of talk to some of our customers, and around 18-ish or so is kind of the sweet spot. Obviously, we can go larger um, if needed or smaller. Yeah, really, uh, one of the factors that plays largely into that is whether there are IT outsourcers in your environment. Yeah. We we tend to see that that if there are IT outsourcers in your environment, then the number balloons somewhat. So if you're a mid-sized group uh, without any IT outsourcer involvement, in other words, you're managing everything in-house, you know, 10 to 12 might be sufficient. So it's really dependent upon the circumstances. Uh, this is probably uh, you know a very uh, loaded, very big sort of question asked in just a few words. But do you guys have? <laughs> do you have? Uh, are there any generalization, generaliz generalizations you can make about how long it typically takes you uh, and a partner to go from ground zero, where you're first trying to identify? the data model that uh, represents that customer's core business to the point where you feel like you're ready to start the uh, the data cleansing in production. You're, you're, you're ready yep. to go day one. Yep. So I can answer that question for you. Uh, I obviously, uh, some, so something you should know about me is that I, I really like to be engaged with every customer that we've had because I I find it increases my knowledge because uh, it, it never surprises me how people really look at things differently from enterprise to enterprise. And so it's one of the things that I really enjoy uh, about the business and being able to speak with people. Um, the answer to your question is this. If the data sources are ready, in other words, uh, if, if you've already done your due diligence, identified the data sources that give you the most complete coverage, and those data sources are available to us, we could literally stand you up and go into production in less than six weeks. Now, if you're, if you're early on, in other words, you're just trying to decide the data model that fits you, and you aren't quite sure about the data sources that are available to you or what would be applicable, then obviously it's a slower roll than that as we go through sessions and understand, do due diligence, look at use cases, those kinds of things. So I would say a stand-up of that nature is probably more in the two- to three-month neighborhood. Okay. Yeah, that's a very common question that, that we do get. And, you know, the answer is, you know, like I said, it's the, the biggest, I guess, challenge that we do have is the customers having the data sources, having everything decided on their end. Because once we're on site and we're engaged, it, it's a very rapid process. We've been doing this for, you know, as a company for 12 years. You know, Michael's been doing it for, you know, longer just in the industry. It's the biggest challenge is really on the, on the customers, them, you know, getting the, talking to security or all the different people that actually need, that have the data that they need and getting their buy-in, right, Michael? Yes. And and just so you have some idea, I mean, uh, very recently, uh, within the last six months, we took a Fortune 50 customer who had a significantly modified data model within ServiceNow from zero to production within six weeks. Uh, we went into production with well over 550,000 CIs. Hmm. To what degree, as you mentioned, uh, you know, once a very tricky part is getting to that place, well, for some customers, I suppose, is getting to that place where they've identified their data model, where they have um, identified what the real system, what the theoretic systems of record are, and what the practical systems of record are, where the data really comes from when mm -hmm. the data isn't as clean as they would like it to have. Sure. Uh, it, and it, it sounds like uh, where 
floodlight and bullseye would really come into play is once somebody has uh, done that legwork and uh, there had been some interesting discussions about uh, how to leverage this system in theory versus that system in theory, then floodlight and bullseye can actually uh, help make that a bit of a reality by by adding some kind of decisioning engine uh, to, to pull data from multiple sources and then figure out what data to really use to produce those golden records. Do you guys have any tools? Are, are there any tools you have as formal products or uh, in the terms of professional services or something to help customers get from that point where they might not know what their data model really is. They might not know what their uh, what their practical systems of record really are. In order to get to that point where they're ready to to leverage bullseye or floodlight in that. Way. Yeah. Yep. I see where you're going. So that's actually a pretty fairly common scenario, uh, particularly. Uh, for customers that I would I would term are mid range enterprise customers that aren't just swimming in arms and legs to do things, mm -hmm. uh, so yes, uh, we we have uh, very qualified professional services folks who are very familiar with uh, a number of different data sources. As as Mark indicated, I believe earlier in the call, you know we've dealt with you know over two hundred and eighty different types of data sources. Uh, the most common 40 or 50 we know intimately well. Uh, in terms of data modeling itself, uh, we do have uh, consulting services available to help customers decide on whether the out-of-the-box data model is sufficient for their needs. Uh, and really, I think that decision is is significantly biased by the degree to which you want to understand uh, your service, your services. And so what I mean by that is that for certain customers, understanding the relationship between a database instance, its database, its server, and where that server is racked is good enough. But others want a, a, a much more granular view. And for those desiring a much more granular view, uh, I would really suggest that you take a strong look at the out-of-the-box data model. And if, if you would like us to help with that, we can. Uh, there are certainly other experts that are available that, that are pure data modelists for ServiceNow. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to do due diligence there. Okay. That makes sense. Any other last questions before we yeah, wrap up? Great, great questions. Great questions. Yeah. Any other last questions as we, uh, you know, wrap up today? Uh, none for me, but thank you very much uh, for the answers you provided. No, oh, you're but, you know, welcome. you asked, yeah, you asked awesome questions, and you know, cloud-based solutions, some of the the typical ones, and uh, uh, but those are all the, you know, all in line with, uh, you know, some of the. Uh, key common questions we get. We're glad that you uh, uh, stood on up and asked them for the group. So we definitely appreciate it. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up today once again. Uh, you know, on behalf of Michael and and the Blazant team and all the you know the SEs and salespeople that recruited you, we, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to to join us uh, for you know the, this first session. You know, a plan is every quarter we're going to have a similar type of session, and and we appreciate uh, you know that you took the time out. We'll make a recording available uh, for this, so you can recap because we understand it's a huge amount of information that you may not have captured the first time. But we're here to help. You all have your sales, you know, contacts that you've been working with and and talking about our solution. Once again, feel free to to reach back out to them and. Uh, you know, we appreciate uh, you taking the time to learn more about the Blazin solution.